So what we're going to do now is talk about aberration. We're going to have two observers in the standard configuration, as usual. And we imagine that they are observing the light from a star and it's definitely not, on, I don't want it to be on the x-axis, okay? It's making some angle with the x-axis. Without loss of generality, I can imagine that the star, the light from the star is in the plane um, of x and y, okay? I, I can rotate these around so that um, uh, it, it's th the both observers agree that its z component is zero. But what they might not agree about is, so now if you draw a spatial picture, so now S spatial picture, so now we've got x, y, and z, um, as there actually, but I'm just looking at S now. And here's the star, and um, I'm taking, I'm imagining that it's in the um, Y, X plane, and it makes an angle, and I'm going to call that alpha, with the X axis. Okay. And in S dashed, that angle will be different. Okay, it'll be alpha dashed. And the question is, what's the relationship between alpha and alpha dashed? <coughs> so the, uh, in that setup, the three velocity of the ray, I, I'm going to call it a ray, it's a ray of light. I'm imagining it's a, this thing I'm going to be referring to as a ray of light. In other words, it's successive photons coming from that star. <coughs> so the three velocity of the ray in S uh, is we call it u, and we, it's going to be this, isn't it? It's minus c cosine of alpha, comma, minus c sine of alpha, comma, zero. So that's going to be the rays coming towards us, and hence the minus signs. It's moving at c, and the angle here is alpha. And we know what the... We worked out what uh, the velocity transformation formula was. So if we now, so that that is u1, that is u2, and that is u3. Okay. And the question is, what's u1 dashed? In other words, what happens in s dashed? Um, so u1 dashed will be minus c cos of alpha dashed by the same argument. But what's this relationship to this? Well, if you look back, um, it's exercise 21. OK, if you want to make a note, that's, that's where we, we did this. Um, it's u1 minus v over 1 minus u1v over c squared. And u1 is minus c cos alpha, so it's uh, minus c cos alpha minus v over 1 minus uh, u1 is minus c cos alpha, so it's going to be 1 plus v cos alpha over c. Everybody happy with that? I've just put those that thing into here. 
<coughs> and then if you take this piece and this piece, what I want to do is divide everything by minus c, and I get therefore cos alpha, whoops, cos alpha dashed, ah, is cos alpha minus v over c over 1 plus v cos alpha over c. Ah, oh, is that right? Um, no, that should be plus. Let me make sure I've got that right now. So I've divided everything by minus c. Yeah, that's now correct, isn't it? Okay, so far so good. What about the um, <coughs> what about the next term? U two dashed. It's going to be minus c sine of alpha dashed. Let's see what happens to that. We've already got a relationship between alpha and alpha dashed, but it's quite interesting to see what happens to u2 as well. And the formula that we discovered a few days ago was that it was u2 over <coughs> gamma 1 minus uh, u1v over c squared. Um, and that is minus C sine alpha over <coughs> the gamma factor multiplied by um, 1 plus V cos alpha over C. Why, 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 why? because u1 is minus c cos alpha. So if you put that in, you get this expression. u2 is minus c sine alpha. And then again, you, do, you look at this piece and at this piece and divide by the minus c, and you get, therefore, sine of alpha dashed is sine of alpha over this thing. Okay. <coughs> and um, there's another way of writing these relationships. It turns out that, um, so if you use the fact, uh, where do I squeeze this? I'll put it up here. So there's a, a, a trigonometric identity, which I am sure you have seen. You may not have it in the front of your head, that the tan of alpha over 2 is the sine of alpha, for any angle alpha, 1 plus the cosine of alpha, okay? <coughs> so that's a trigonometrical identity. If you use that for the alphas and the alpha dashes, you get this, and I'll let you fill in the detail, uh, I'll write it up over there. You get a rather nice formula but relating alpha and alpha dashed. So finally you achieve this. You find that the tan of alpha dashed over 2 is this number times the tan of alpha over 2. <coughs> so there's a little bit of calculation for you to do, but it's, I hope, easy playing around with those two equations and that 
identity. Uh, it's this one that I want to use. So let me pause there and check that you're happy that you've understood how I got those two and you believe that you will be able to <coughs> achieve this one. <coughs> yeah. Good. Now what we're going to do is interpret this. We're going to work out what this would mean, what it would look like. So we're going to imagine we've got our two frames of reference, S and S dashed. And um, so imagine that we've got our two spaceships, OK? And one of them, they're completely identical. And, and some of you are in one of them and the rest of you are in the other one. And one of them um, is at rest with respect to the stars reasonably nearby. OK? So, um, or if you prefer, you could ignore the star. No, it's probably better not to. Take the, take the stars above a certain magnitude. Take the really bright stars, OK? And of course, they're all moving with respect to each other, but there'll be a sort of an average rest frame, especially if you don't wait too long, OK? If you if you take, if you're talking about doing an experiment over a day or two, then they won't have moved terribly much. So there's a there's a sort of rest frame of the very bright stars around you. And one of the spaceships is uh, is not moving in that rest frame. Just sitting there, you've had your lunch. The other spaceship is flying past at velocity v and we want v to be quite a high velocity and we're going to what we're going to do is we imagine the two spaceships here's the one that's staying still and here's the one which is flying past and as they pass each other okay they take photographs of the night sky everything is black they're in the middle of space okay so they take photographs and then they and, and this one doesn't stop, of course. As it passes through, they, they agree to take... This one takes a photograph, and this one takes photographs of the night sky. And this one is carrying on. And then they're communicating by radio, and they exchange photographs, OK? And they compare the photographs. And what will they see? OK? And the one that's stationary, in a sense, sees what's really there in some sense because it's it's in the rest frame of the bright stars and so the one that's moving will there will be some aberration there'll be some effect and the question is what is that effect so what we do is we take a star for which uh, alpha is 90 degrees. In other words, so alpha is the angle which the spaceship at rest is measuring. So in other words, that star is somewhere there or there. Any, any, any star which is at right angles to the direction in which the other spaceship is moving. OK? <coughs> And in fact, it's quickest just to use that formula there. Um, so cos of alpha, st alpha dashed will be um, V over C. So if alpha is 90 degrees, then the cosine of 90 is 0, OK? And that's 0, so you just get that term there. So it's quite easy. And now suppose that the moving spaceship is going quite fast, uh, C root 3 over 2. Um, what is root 3? 1.7? Something like that, isn't it? So root 3 over 2 is 
0.85, something like that. So this is 0.85 of the velocity of light. So it's fast. Okay. Then V over C, then alpha, then cos of alpha will be root 3 over 2. Uh, sorry, cos of alpha dashed will then be root 3 over 2. And so alpha dashed will be 30 degrees. OK, I've chosen the angles so that this all comes out very easily. So now let's think what that means. So from the point of view of the stationary spaceship, they were looking at a star at right angles, somewhere in the plane at right angles to the direction of motion of the moving spaceship. And that, when for the moving spaceship, which was the piece of chalk, wasn't it? For the moving spaceship, that star is seen at 30 degrees from the direction of motion, right? So what was there is observed there. And of course, if it's true for that star, it's true for all of the stars around. So the, the, all of the stars that were that side have got squashed into a cone of half angle 30 degrees. So that's the aberration effect. And the stars behind you have also everything's moving away from that point and towards that point in the image. Everything gets distorted around. Um, and that's the aberration effect. Um, of course, it's also true that the colours of the stars change, right? Because the moving spaceship is moving towards those stars. So they're blue, and it's moving away from those stars, so they're red. So if you're good at uh, computation, and you have some good software, you can probably code for, for making this happen. You could actually, if you're really good, I'm not good enough to do this, but if you were, I guess you could probably do it in Mathematica, for example. You could somehow dream up a, you want a black sphere with some white points on it and then you you press a button and and v changes and all the stars will slide over the sphere and and go blue at this end and come red so if anybody manages to do that please send me a, a version of it anyway that's aberration somebody asked me a few days ago um whether there was a we were talking about rapidity and one of you said um it's so beautiful to see how rapidity simplifies the Lorentz transforms, but surely it's got some geometrical... And, and I, at, at the time I, I thought, yes, it has, but I couldn't remember quite what immediately. Um, but here it is. This, f this factor here is e to the minus phi. OK. So that's quite nice. We saw that formula a few days ago. So the relationship between the tan of the half angle is, is e to the minus phi. One get, it just gets multiplied by e to the minus phi. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. <coughs> now uh, I'm using exactly the same setup. Uh, I don't need that I don't think so I'll rub that out as well. So I'm not changing anything I'm just going to make a little bit more explicit this, um, this business of the two observers, the two spaceships, looking at their skies, OK? They, each of them is in a big black sphere with little white points on it, OK? Looking at the night sky from well, actually, looking at the night sky here, it's been beautifully clear and there have been lovely stars and so forth. But if you're in a spaceship in the middle of nowhere, then, of course, the night sky is all around you. It's, you're inside a black sphere with little points of light shining at you on that sphere. And we're going to take that seriously, geometrically. So in S, what we do is we draw... Um, 
a sphere around the origin of S, a unit sphere, so its radius is 1. <coughs> I'm going to try and draw it more accurately, just a minute. So I'll try and draw it bigger. I'm out of practice, I used to be able to draw circles quite well. That's better. Um, what I want to do is I want to, so that's the, that's the sphere of radius 1 whose centre is the origin of the frame S. It's the spatial sphere, right? I'm not talking about time now, I'm just talking about the spatial sphere. Uh, I'm going to take um, the tangent plane there. I'm imagining that the x-axis is along here. And here's the origin. And this is the y-axis here. And the z-axis is coming up there. OK? <coughs> and I'm going to take... Um, so this is our sky, this is our night sky. Sometimes in the books and articles it's called the celestial sphere. Okay, the night sky, the celestial sphere. And S observes a star, and here it is. So I'm going to, uh, do I want it there? Yeah, that'll be, that'll be fine. I'm going to call that position on this sphere, I'm going to call it R. And so the light coming into the origin of S from R makes an angle alpha with the x-axis. Wow! What a nice creature. Um, <coughs> so, if you can remember, please, your elementary geometry, can you tell me what that angle is? Alpha over 2. <coughs> so this, you might have thought, this is a bit awkward, because instead of using the angle alpha, we keep on having to use alpha over 2. But actually, alpha over 2 is a very natural angle in this picture. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue that line here until it hits this. I'm imagining that this plane here is a screen. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to project all of the night sky onto that screen. So instead of looking at a, a, a sphere around us, I'm going to project everything on that sphere onto the screen. So that point gets projected to that point and, and so on. If there's another star down here, then it gets projected to that point and the star here gets projected to that point and so on. And then and then we're just looking at a screen, and we're used to that, you know, looking at computer screens and televisions and so forth. And this projection is actually a well-known projection. It's called stereographic, okay? From this point. If there's a star here, bad luck, you're not going to see it. <laughs> okay. There's only one star missing. So. If there's a planet on it and some people on the planet, well, tough. Okay, we, we don't catch them. So now, everything we see, we can project onto this screen, and, and we can think of this as the information which we take a photograph of and send to the other spaceship. And the other spaceship has exactly the same arrangement, it also does stereographic projection. Everything is exactly the same, except everything has got dashes on it. Okay. 
I, don't, I won't draw it again. You just imagine exactly the same, but everything has got dash, 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 dash every, everywhere. And now you think about this formula here. Th what's this distance here? Well, this distance divided by this distance is the tan of alpha over 2, OK? This distance is 2, because it was the unit sphere, radius 1. So this distance here divided by 2 is the tan. So this distance must be twice tan alpha over 2. And then in the other picture, which I will draw actually, you've got exactly the same thing. And you've got exactly the same star. <coughs> and its distance will be twice tan whoops, alpha dashed over 2. So the, 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 the S dashed spaceship takes this photograph, the S spaceship takes this photograph, and they compare the photographs. <coughs> and then what you see is that the photographs are exactly the same as each other, exactly the same, except that there's a scale. One of the photographs has been magnified compared to the other one, right? Because this is just tan of alpha over 2, alpha dashed over 2, is e to the minus phi times tan of alpha over 2. So one of the photographs is just simply magnified with respect to the other one. <coughs> um, and that's a very nice way of thinking of aberration. It's an extremely simple effect if you stereographically project. Now this has a, um, a consequence, which depends on a little piece of mathematics, an important piece of mathematics, that stereographic projection um, has various beautiful properties. It's called a conformal mapping. It preserves shapes. In particular, if you draw a circle on the, on the screen, it maps to a circle on the sphere. Uh, or conversely, if you take a circle on the sphere, it maps to a circle on the screen. Circles map to circles. And, <coughs> and so the two, the two spaceships, if, if there's something circular, if there's some constellation that's circular, it will be circular in both cases. Right? They agree on circular images. Um, and this was um, observed, have I got a reference for it? It was observed by Roger Penrose. I ought to know this. Ah, oh, yeah, I have got it. It's at the end of my lecture notes. Uh, in 1959. <coughs> wrote a paper called The Visual Appearance of a Moving Sphere. So if you've got a, a, a sphere, a big, like the, um, what's that evil spaceship in Star Wars? A dark star, right? So, so which is a big sphere. And, and it's moving past. And you think, <gasps> is it going to stop? I hope not. And it's moving past. What does it look like? Does it look sort of ellipsoidal because of Lorentz contraction? And the answer is no. It's a circle in your night sky. It's, it's still going to look circular, right? Sti so the, the outline of a moving sphere is still circular. Um, and in Penrose's article in 1959, he introduced this beautiful piece of geometry just to show you that although on the sphere you've got this very strange distortion of all the stars are moving around like that, if you stereographically project onto the screen, it's a simple magnification, or the opposite of a magnification, one or the other. <coughs> um, and in fact, the, <coughs> the, um, 
there's more to it. There's much more mathematics lying underneath this. Um, the transformations of the night sky coming from the Lorentz group are just the Merbius transformations. They're just the um, uh, in local coordinates a z plus b over c z plus d. So although the Lorentz, which is a very natural, the, the, the sphere is a very natural space from the point of view of mathematicians, we play with them all the time, and, and uh, the Merbius group acting on the sphere is a very sort of elementary group that you can use to study geometry on the sphere. Um, <coughs> and it turns out that that's what the Lorentz group is doing on your night sky. Um, and this observation is, is, essentially is, is essentially that. OK, well, uh, um, with that lovely piece of geometry, I'll stop. You now know everything there is to know about special relativity. <laughs> Not quite. I've, of course, there is a lot more. I've had to miss out lots of things. Um, but I hope I've put you into a good position to, to learn more, uh, to read books on special relativity. And I also hope that one day you'll do some general relativity. That's much tougher mathematically because you have to do some, you have to understand how to describe a curved four-dimensional space-time, which is, takes a little bit of doing. But it's worth it because it's beautiful theory. Okay, we'll stop there. Thank you very much.